Greetings, we hope all is well. This is the Walking by Faith podcast hosted by Minister Larry Montgomery, Senior and Friends. Genesis 1-1, KJV, states, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And 2 Corinthians 5-7, KJV, states, For we walk by faith, not by sight. While Romans 10:17 KJV, says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Which brings us to Hosea 4:6, KJV, that states, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Welcome to another episode of the Walking by Faith podcast. I am your host Minister Larry Montgomery. Senior. The sole purpose of this podcast is to present candid discussions about various words that are found in the Bible with an eye towards defining in the context of these troubled times along with clarity, insight, commentary and hopefully some revelation to interested listeners. This podcast is a presentation of the Montgomery Media Group.tv and can be found on most podcast platforms. Video presentations are available on YouTube, the African American Shopping Network channel. This show is sponsored by www.theauthorscorner.online. Please like us and follow us on Facebook. And we're here. God bless you. And, uh, you know, it's been a rough day today. Some major technical difficulties, but... We're going to do this. We're going to talk about this topic today, which is the five roles of a biblical husband. And I think this is important. We, I forget exactly what we were going to uh, talk about because um, I got engrossed in this particular topic. And um, I'd like to say that this is going to be a feature discussion in an upcoming uh, book I'm working on entitled Understanding the Cost of Picking Up Your Cross, Picking Up the Cross. Hopefully that'll be on uh, <clears throat> available on Amazon uh, probably next month early, but I'll keep you informed. So, you know, I didn't have my um, usual startup commercial. That's because of the technical difficulties, but thank God we made it anyway. The devil got busy, but he doesn't get the victory. Why by crossing the bridge to fatherhood? Hosea 4.6 KJV tells us that my people perish for lack of knowledge. In today's culture, that statement seems to become true about the day when it comes to black children. When we look at the impact of fatherlessness on the black family and household over the last 30 years, we see the culmination of all of our culture's efforts to disparage black people and breaking down our most basic stronghold of family unit. Today's culture has used and misused black men almost since the day we arrived in America. We have been abused, enslaved, and Used for everything from being lazy when they don't really employ us, to physically abusing us when we excel, enslaving us to do what they should have done for themselves and men. This American culture we live in has incarcerated us, experimented on us, and designed a separate definition to us. And as soon as we start complying with this designated new nature, they blame us for not succeeding in causing fear and distrust in the very same culture we find ourselves discouraged to be a part of. So, what do we need to overcome this brainwashing, you ask? We need to return to our roots. We need to get back to being the kings and queens we once were. We need direction from God. The good news is that He has already given us the direction we need. After crossing the bridge to fatherhood is just that. If we review the directions the Bible holds for our return to greatness within our own homes and communities. Read Crossing the Bridge to Fatherhood by Elder Dr. Larry Montgomery Sr. Available on Amazon and www. 
the author's corner. I'll find in both ebook and paperback formats. Get your copy today and read it to your entire family. So when we talk about the um, five, five roles of biblical husbands, I want to first preface it by saying this discussion isn't limited to those men who are either husbands or soon to become husbands or maybe even one day becoming a husband. This is a conversation that really should be had in, in, a, in a Bible study where everyone is welcome, men, women, even children, so they can get an understanding of what the Bible says about how you should conduct yourself and understand why you're conducting yourself a particular way. Because as I say all the time, you know, I ask the question, why are you here? You know, if you think that you're here because it's all about you, then you need to have a conversation with a mental health professional. Because this life is not about you. It's about God and what God would have you to do within the context of his people. We're all here, and he talks about servitude. We're all here to serve each other and him. Well, him preferably, and by serving him, we are serving others. And so we all have a role. And, you know, people don't really think about this. When we leave here, this earth, we are going to be somewhere else, hopefully in heaven. And if you think heaven is going to be kind of like a um, commercial break, I'm just going to lay around and, and eat uh, grapes and lounge in the sunshine and forever. That's not quite how it's going to work. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Give this some thought. <clears throat> the Bible talks about the city, the New Jerusalem, which is the city, kingdom city. Who do you think is going to build that city? Who do you think is going to maintain that city? The Bible talks about in Revelations about the new earth. Now, if you think back to the beginning when God created man and put him in the Garden of Eden, and we're going to mention that in this conversation. What was God expecting man to do while he was there? He wanted Adam to work in the garden to maintain it and to, how do you put it? Um, come on, the devil's just getting busy. Not conquer, I don't want to say conquer, but to manage, <laughs> I'm fighting for this word here, to manage the garden and to multiply. And so, you know, God realized, you know, well, in order for him to multiply, he's got to have a way to do that. And he did not design Adam to bear children. So he, and in as you think through it, you'll see that all the other creatures in the um, garden, around the garden on the planet, which he created, had mates. So he created Eve as a help mate to help him and to mate with him. Okay, so that he could 
man could multiply. So with that, when you go to heaven, when you get there, you can you know, look me up and say, you know, <laughs> Elder Montgomery, you were right. We're not just going to sit around here like we're on the beach and on a sunny day and eat grapes and drink pina coladas. We got work to do. And that work, whatever work it is, is going to be forever. Now, there's no necessary discussion about, well, what level of work you're going to be doing. That's all going to work its way out. So, but back to today's topic. What the Bible says about fathers. Fatherhood was one of the first responsibilities God gave men. Fatherhood was one of the first jobs God gave men. Immediately after creating Adam and Eve, God commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. One of his primary purposes for marriage was offspring who would fill the earth with God's praise and glory. However, providing sperm for conception is merely the beginning of God's expectations for fathers. The Bible provides many points of guidance on what God's expectation is to be a good father. Here are just a few verses that describe a father's role. Psalm chapter 103 verse 13 as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 7 The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. Colossians chapter 3 verse 21 Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 1 9 Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive, that you may gain insight, for I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 24 Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 6 Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old he will not depart from it. 3 John chapter 1 verse 4 I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Psalm chapter 127 verse 3 5 Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. 10 Characteristics of a Godly Father A godly father knows God, it should be without stating, but many men want their children to have a relationship with God but do not have that relationship themselves. Children model what they see. So godly fatherhood begins within the heart of a man. A godly father loves and honors his wife. It has been said that the best gift a father can give his children is to love their mother. Even if a man is divorced or single, he can still model respectful behavior towards his child's mother. Children imitate what they see. A godly father accepts responsibility for his children's spiritual training, while providing financially for a family is an important responsibility for fathers. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8 it is not their only responsibility. A father must encourage Christian character in his children by his example as well as his words of instruction and the expectations of behavior he sets forth for and enforces with his children. A godly father is continually aware of his influence. Fathers may not realize it but everything they do is influencing their children. Words alone are not enough. A godly father models selfless service. Much of Jesus' earthly life was given to serving others. As followers of Jesus, we are to imitate that service. Matthew chapter 20 verse 28. Godly fathers figure out ways to involve their children in acts of service. A godly father is consistent. Nothing confuses children more than inconsistency, either in discipline or example. A father that is loving one minute and angry the next creates insecurity in his children. A godly father disciplines his children appropriately. Discipline is a part of child-rearing and should not be ignored or solely delegated to the mother. 
Hebrews chapter 12 verse 9 10 reminds us that earthly fathers disciplined us for our own good and our heavenly father does the same. A godly father does not allow himself to be controlled by outside influences. Addictions such as alcohol or drugs often create a home environment marked by insecurity, fear, and depression. Fathers that display addictive behaviors often teach their children to do the same. A godly father is a man under authority. Due to his sinful nature, a man will fight to be his own boss. However, Jesus demonstrated that he was a man under the authority of his heavenly father. He readily gave credit to God for his successes and submitted himself fully to the will of God. A godly father will lead. The world is in desperate need of men who will lead wisely. Leadership is not domination or control. A leader is one who goes first. He sets the pace for the family by practicing what he preaches. He is on the lookout for dangers and takes initiative to protect his family from them. He is a man that his children can be proud of. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 6. Just released. Heavenly Invitation by Dr. Larry Montgomery, Sr. Are you going to heaven? Ever ask how can I guarantee my eternal destination? Want to know what is the difference between Sheol, Hades, Hell, the Lake of Fire? Ever wonder did Jesus go to hell between his death and resurrection? Do you know where hell is? Question is Satan the master of hell? Want to know what is purgatory? Can you tell me what happens after death? Do you know the nine facts about heaven? What are the 10 distinct differences between faith and unbelief? Read The Heavenly Invitation by Dr. Larry Montgomery, Sr. Available on Amazon and at theauthorscorner.online. Order your copy today. Thanks, and God bless. The five roles of... That's roles, R-O-L-E-S of a biblical husband number one a husband is a leader we find that in first corinthians 11 and 3 but i want you to know that the head of every man is christ the head of woman is man and the head of the church and the head of christ is god i'm sorry <laughs> So it's three things. I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So we see the we, we see how the, the hierarchy. God, Christ, man, and woman. Okay. It's not let's not get derogatory, let's not start looking you know, listening to what the devil is saying about, you know, what well, you, you, you're supposed to be number, who's why is he number one, and, and so on, so, so, and ain't the devil's program. It was never his program. So don't listen to it. We live by the word of God, and it is written that this is the order that he would have. A biblical husband is a leader, not a lord. He is a builder of his family, not a bully. A leader is not a lord. A leader is not a dominating, abusive, bullying, aggressive, angry, diminishing man. Jesus exemplified what biblical leadership looks like in his servant leadership. To be leaders, husbands must be proactive, pursue God, pastor his home, be a protector. To be leaders, husbands must be proactive, pursue God, pastor his home, be a protector. Men are to step out and initiate things. Be proactive. Don't be passive. When Adam and Eve committed sin in the garden, God asked Adam, where are you? God did not ask Eve first because God expects 
men to carry leadership responsibilities. We find that in Genesis 3 and 9. A man cannot be a good leader if he is not first a good follower of the Holy Spirit. Let me read that again. A man cannot be a good leader if he is not first a good follower of the Holy Spirit. You cannot lead your home if you are not led by the Lord. That means that it is every man's job to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Your manual is the Bible. The priest of the home, to be a pastor or priest in your home, the first thing it means is to bring your family to church on Sundays. The first thing. Bring your family to church on Sundays. Now those of you who are out there and see these men who have baby mamas, maybe no wife, and if your baby mama has a baby by him, that's his family. And in the definition here in the Bible, you are to bring your family to church on Sundays. You should take the you should take the decision. You can choose to bring your family to church on Sunday. You don't ask your children what they want to do on Sunday. You bring them. The second thing the pastor of the home has to do is live out the Christian faith in front of his wife and children. We're talking about that whole thought process of, well, you do as I say, because I'm the parent. You do as I say because I'm your husband. You do as I say because I'm bigger than you. You do as I say because I make more money than you. You do as I say because I'm smarter than you. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about you as the one who's opened his mouth. Do practice what you preach to everyone. Don't just bring your family to church, but bring faith to your family. Whether it is once a day or a week, establish family devotions. If any of your family members has a problem, they know they can run to the pastor of the house first. When they come to you, Call on your shepherd, Jesus Christ, before you call on your church pastor or life group leader. As the husband, when the children or the wife comes to you for something about an issue or whatever or desire, you go to Christ first. Okay? Because you want to do what you, you want to satisfies their desires, but sometimes you're not in that position to do that. And I don't want to have a whole lot of excuses. Well, I can't do this, I can't do that, or whatever. You go to God and ask God, look, God, you know, I need this to, because, you know, my son wants this, or you know. And God will let you understand how it's going to work out. It's not the right time for them. They'll have to wait, or there's other options that might be even more valuable to them that they haven't considered that you might be able to talk to them about. To be the protector, God created men to be physically stronger than women so that they can protect their families. God designed your body for a particular task. And he's giving you muscles. You know, this, this basically, he's giving you muscles to do those tasks that need to be done. 
God did not give you muscle on so you can ride, raise your hand against your wife and children. You are not a bully. You are a builder. You are not a Lord. You are a leader. Jesus does not abuse his church and neither should men abuse their wives. We find that in Ephesians 5 and 25. There is no room for dominating, ruling, controlling, or suppressing a daughter of God in a godly marriage. As a servant leader, you should serve your spouse and protect your family. Raising your voice is not acceptable in marriage. Usually when a man raises their voice, it is because they have already lost an argument. You know how people get, you know, once you start a, a conversation and it gets a little personal and you start to get agitated, you know, because the other person is either making better points or is not on point with your con with your concern. Sometimes you, you get a little heated and you start to raise your voice because, you know, the temperature starts to go up because you're working, you're stressing yourself to make your point or to get them to understand and go along with what you're saying. The Bible tells us don't do that. It is better to improve your argument than to raise your voice. Number two, a husband is a laborer. Oh, the husband is a worker. Genesis 2 and 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend. That was the word I was looking for before, <laughs> earlier. Put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. This took place before the fall. God put the man to work in the garden and obtained or no ordained a six day work week. Now I'm not saying that a five day work week is bad. It is just not biblical. God did not create you to have vacations on earth. He created you to create, to make things. When we go to heaven, we are not going on holiday but to rule, reign, and manage things with Christ. We're going to heaven, not on holiday, but to rule, reign, and manage things with Christ. There's going to be work for you in heaven, baby. <laughs> okay. And it's going to go on forever. That's how it is. Not a bad thing. God is not idle. Jesus said, my father is working and I am working and I am working. That's John 5 and 27. Our God works and he created us to work. 1 Timothy 5 and 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's a whole conversation right there by itself. In the 1950s in the United States, one in 50 men aged 25 to 54 did not want to work. Today, that statistic is one in nine. That equates to over 7 million men in the United States today. They are physically able, but rely on government welfare or somebody else to provide for them. They are not men, but grown up boys. Boys are provided for by their mothers. Men provide for themselves. Grown up or mature men provide for themselves, their wives and their children. Now, yeah, we could have a whole conversation uh, about, well, let me finish the point here, and then I'm going to stop and we're going we're to talk a little bit about that, that issue. Some proclaim that I can't work, I'm called, I'm called to ministry. We have a pandemic of lazy men. 
Some of these men over-spiritualize things, saying that God has called them into ministry. Therefore, they cannot work. Living by faith doesn't mean not working. Don't forget that our Savior Jesus Christ spent most of his adult life working and doing manual labor. Stop saying I am not going to work and want God to provide for me because he called me into ministry. If you have a family, that is your ministry. You need to provide for them. Another type of man, dreamers, not workers. Another set of lazy men is not as spiritual, not so spiritual, but has more dreams than Dr. Martin Luther King. They sit and dream up ideas that won't work. Then they push their wives to work hard to finance their dream, their idea, which was dumb from the beginning. These types of men are often people who had no father figure in their lives to bring discipline and were over and were over mothered and pampered. You can't do, you cannot be anything. Hmm. This is a lie. You cannot be anything you want. You cannot be a bird. You are a human being. Most children will not grow up to be celebrity athletes or presidents. We need to stop lying to our children and start building their character and work ethic so that they can become something in this world, not anything. Dreams don't pay bills. Diligent work does. Businesses do not work if you don't work. You cannot sit on a couch and dream your business into work. You have to work and make things happen. If you want to have a side hustle that is brilliant, get a full-time job to take care of your family. Then on your days or time off, you can start learning the other job. Do not quit your full-time job until the side hustle covers the income that your full-time job provided. Do not strain your family or abandon your role as a laborer and provider. It is not pleasing to God and the Bible says it makes you worse than an unbeliever. No work is waste, Proverbs 14 and 23. In all labor, there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. There is no profit in just dreaming or playing golf and video games. There is profit in work, waiting for years to get a job because you are too proud, entitled, and too mothered is not good. We need to labor. If you want to be a prosperous man, learn to work. As you work, one day you will get a better job and can run your own company. The problem with young people today is that is they get so overwhelmed by work. Their mental health is not stable because they are finally forced to work an eight-hour job. Men, we are better than that. We are stronger than that. Disconnect from TikTok and social media, read the Bible, and work. When you start to work and do it well, a lot of your other issues will be taken care of. Look at the case of Joseph. Joseph entered Potiphar's 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 house of work. House Joseph entered Potiphar's house to work. Potiphar's wife was tempting him, and he had no time for her. But when David came out of his room after sleeping all day, Instead of going to war, he could not resist the lady he saw. Men who are working hard 
and applying themselves to their business are men who are more likely to overcome temptation. Some men argue that in some countries, unemployment pays better than working. There is no scripture in the Bible that supports this kind of lifestyle. You might need to go on benefits for a season or some months, but not for years. It doesn't matter if welfare pays better. God calls you to work hard and apply yourself. I challenge all the boys to grow up and become men. I challenge men to become mature men by providing for their families. Now, I'm not going to go on to the other three um, um, roles that men should play. I just want to mention here because it seems to be something that's become um, acceptable in our society today here in the U.S. This whole thing about, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm growing up, I'm working hard every day to uh, be a rapper. Yeah, crickets. Everybody can't be a rapper just like everybody can't be a professional athlete. Everybody can't be an actor, at least one that gets paid for their acting. Some of us actually have to work. And that doesn't mean you can't make good money. You know, when you go up into a, a movie studio, you might see, they may be filming, let's say, Denzel Washington. Now he walks in the room, and he done clicked off $100,000 just to show up, not necessarily do anything. By the end of the uh, the project, he's probably made five, ten million dollars plus all the royalties that's going to come later on. But there are cameramen there. There are audio people there. There are carpenters there. There are electricians there. There are drivers there. There are maintenance people there. There are window washers there that make a salary that they can support their family from with. So you want to be a rapper and all you're doing is spending your time and energy hanging out late with people who either are unemployed or underemployed trying to do the same thing. You stink and they stink. But you're all spending money that you don't have on liquor, being tempted by women or women being tempted by men, whatever. And you can't figure out how come life is hard. And the only pleasure you get is going out, hanging out with your rapping friends who more than likely stink. And stink doesn't mean that you're not good. It just means you ain't getting paid. Oh, well, I'm not getting paid yet. You know, but my time is coming. Yeah, mm -hmm, sure. I understand. But what are you missing between now when you started to the point where you, to the date that you actually sign a contract and get a check? What did you miss as far as your role to show your children, to show your wife that you are the head of the household, that you are the laborer, that you are the priest or pastor of the house. What did you do? Oh, I had to, that was a sacrifice. That, one, that wasn't what your wife signed up for or your baby mama signed up for. That's not what your kids signed up for. That's your dream. Maybe a pipe dream. I don't know. But it's your dream. You're still sleeping and thinking that that's going to happen. Just one more second. I just need one more second at this. And in the meantime, there's no check coming in. You know, the wife has got to work harder and raise the children because you're either out in the street or you're home sleep. So you can get up 
and go out in the street. Oh, the studio, I'm sorry. Listen, if you're going to be a rapper, trust me, God will lead you to and make the way for you. You're trying to make it happen. Then lies what the devil wants you to do. Try. Keep trying. God says, if you follow, if you trust me, I'll take you there. I'll put you where you need to be, where you're going to be successful. Everybody's not going to be a brain surgeon. That's just not how it works. Somebody needs brain surgery. Okay? No, no sense in having a brain surgeon if everybody's a brain surgeon and nobody needs brain surgery. <laughs> so, you know, it, it might sound a little far-fetched, but the reality, you get the point. You get the point. You need to stop and think, pray, ask God, and he will tell you. He will lead you. He will let his spirit lead you to where you need to go to turn your situation around. That doesn't mean that, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a rapper and I'm, I'm good. That doesn't mean that you may not, you may be, that you, you had no value, you may be a, a, a better musician than a rapper. But I'm using that as an example. I'm not saying that's the, the end all. You know, we got brothers out there, fathers out there, trying all kinds of side hustles. Well, that's what they are, side hustle, until they become the one that can pay all the bills. It's a side. You still got the bills to pay. And yeah, we can have the conversation, well, here in America, you know, there's racist and all that there. But look, somebody's got to stop and say, well, if I work hard at selling dollar bottles of water on the highway corner, I'm going to be able to sell. I'm going to sell enough water that I can hire somebody to help me sell this water. And then at some point, if we keep working hard, we'll be able to maybe have our own water distillery, have our own brand, and hire a lot more people. So I started out small, but I started out with something that was going to make me, enable me to support myself and my family. Now, if you're single and you don't have a family, you pretty much do whatever you want to do. But if you have any thought of life is not just about you, okay, that things may change or you might want things to change. I mean, I met my wife. I was at a garden party in high school. Walked in the, walked in the backyard. That's what we had then. You know, nowadays I know it's strip club or, you know, the bar or whatever, you know, things like that. You look to meet people. I walked in as a garden party in the backyard. Walked in the gate and all the people in the, all the people in the yard. I saw one person look right at her. I had a chill from my head to my feet. Never got this kind of chill ever again. And to tell you the truth, she felt the same way. Hadn't spoken a word to her. But God led me there for that moment. I wanted to get married at some point in life, you know. So I came from was, you know, broken. But I still know that in my life, what I wanted for me was, you know, better than that. You know, I, I, I cannot criticize my parents. They said they did the best they could with what they had to work with. And a lot of us don't have enough information in order to make solid decisions or comprehensive decisions that are going to work for not only now, but the future. So anyway, enough about me. And I'm going to apologize that this week we had so many technical difficulties that we weren't able to 
bring you the quality of the program that we would have liked to as far as all of the bells and whistles. But I think the word that we have here should help you think a little more. And not only, I'm not necessarily talking to you personally, but with this information, you are armed and then when an opportunity comes or you see a need, you can impart it to someone else that might help them. This is what part of the Great Commission, you know, is to spread the word of God and then spreading the word to help people. I don't have to go out and lift a whole building in order to help you move forward. I can just tell you, well, God will help you. And if that requires moving that building or moving you, God decide to help you, he'll help you. The question is, is can you trust them? Trust is built over time. So test them. God, I need this. Lord, will you help me? And I come to you because I can't go to anybody else to get it done. No one else has the power or even is perceived to have the power to help me. You know, just because your boss or you see a businessman has millions of dollars, you think he has millions of dollars or whatever, doesn't mean that he's there to help you. Right? Well, you can help me by giving me a job. They giving out jobs over there? You're a millionaire, you should be able to give me a job. It's not quite how it works. But with God, you might not have to say a word. That millionaire look down, look over at you. Hey, you look like somebody I could use. You need a job? Want a job? I want you to come work for me. Only God can do that for you. So anyway, let me stop right there. And next week, we're going to come back and pick up the rest of these roles that men should understand that God has ordained for you. And ordaining it for you, if you step forward to um, apply yourself, he will help you accomplish those challenges or those uh, those commands that he's laid out for you. And so with that, let me just thank you and thank God for you. And we'll see you next time, God willing, and the creek don't rise. Thanks be to God. You have been listening to another episode of the Walking by Faith podcast hosted by Minister Larry Montgomery, Senior and Friends. Join us again next time as we continue to labor in this vineyard with an eye towards bringing the words of God to those who are interested. Remember, the sole purpose of this podcast is to present candid discussions about various words that are found in the Bible with an eye towards defining in the context of these troubled times along with clarity, insight, commentary and hopefully some revelation to interested listeners. This podcast is a presentation of the Montgomery Media Group TV and can be found on most podcast platforms. Video presentations are available on YouTube, the African American Shopping Network channel. This show is sponsored by www. The Author's Corner. Online. Please like us and follow us on Facebook. May God continue to bless you and yours until next time. God bless.